You are listening to episode 121 of the Game Deflators podcast. My name's John, and I am joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody here at the Game Deflators podcast, we like to talk about games. We've recently picked up games we're currently playing, and I've got an inkling about today's Inflation Deflation Challenge. Well done, sir. Well done. I like that one. That was good. Well... As Ryan said, Inkling, I mean, if you don't know, last week we talked about Splatoon. This week we played Splatoon uh, on the Wii First U. time. Yeah, first time. You know, honestly, I didn't know a lot about that game, and we'll get more into it. It was, it was good. But, as always, Ryan, let's talk a little bit about our recent pickups. You go ahead and do your section, because while you do that, I'm going to find video game trivia on a whim, like we always do. Oh, wow. Three weeks down, and John's finally on top of it. So, if you're a regular listener... Of the podcast, you will know that I never buy anything, and that I never have time to play video games, and that I will never beat Persona 4, because that's just the kind of person I am. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> that might have been the best thing ever. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't buy anything this week. Um, I am excited. I did hear rumors about next month's um, PlayStation Plus stuff, and I think that they were saying that, like, Maybe there would be some good stuff there. I really don't think that they they would actually do Final Fantasy VII Remake. I think somebody was just having some really wishful thinking with that because they did just they did just announce like the DLC and stuff at the Sony State of Play. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so if that came out, I know John has that. Sorry, I was looking up trivia. I wasn't paying attention to what you were saying just now. But I, I, I would pick that up. I would pick up the DLC for that, too. Okay. But that's not anything that I've done this week. And I didn't have any time to play games. I played a little bit. I learned how to play Go, sort of. I played, like, six or seven matches of Go. And the last one, I actually did okay at. So that was fun. Okay, so can you explain Go a little bit for people? Like, I honestly still have no flipping idea what Go is. Okay, Go, it's, like, a big board. And you've got... Uh, black tiles and white tiles and you like put them down and you try to like encircle the enemy's color and if you do you take like all of that territory it's like i think there's like more moves in go than like molecules in the observable universe or something crazy like that like it was like the big next step for ai to try to compete with like you know how they have like Eventually, it was able to beat people at chess, and eventually, it was able to beat people at Jeopardy, and now it can beat people at Go as of like a couple years ago or something. But it's this like super deep game, and it's just, it's not like any pieces like in chess, how they have different moves and stuff, or is it like a Mahjong type of thing? Kind of. I don't know much about Mahjong. Mahjong's like various tiles with different symbols and colors. And... No, these are just like white tiles and black tiles. One person's. Oh, one, okay. one person's the other, and you just put pieces down, and it's, uh, you're just trying to control as much territory as you can, and it's all based off of, like, <sighs> so it's kind of like my, my game Blockus that I have, where you have four different people, each of a single color, and different, like, Tetris-like pieces, and you're trying to get overall board control, and lose as many pieces as you can on the table, so at the end of a game you don't have so many. Is it kind of like that? No, it's, it's like, it's like, imagine if you had an empty checkerboard yeah. and you were just putting checkers down on the board and at the end, whoever had the most like control of the board with their color checkers is like the winner. Okay. Yeah. So it's the same thing as Blockus in a sense. Blockus says you, four people are putting down whatever amount of colors they can and whoever at the end of a game has the least amount of tiles left uh, from a count standpoint, so the most on the board wins. And you take over territory and invade other people's sections. It, it sounds similar based on what I've experienced with that. So yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Dude. It's like well, a super ancient game. It's crazy. Nice. Yeah. I, I I don't stand a chance. Who knows? I I might download an app and see if I can't try to try to challenge him later. But we'll that's play, that's all I played. We'll play some blockers at some point. And you'll get the idea. And okay. Yeah, maybe that'll help you with that. Uh, so in terms of currently playing, I'll go into my pickup. Well, I guess I'll go into my pickup first because it's tied to currently playing. So, uh, we picked up Fall Guys on the PS4, uh, and PS Plus again. So, um, for those of you who don't know, you can go to cdkeys.com and usually pick up PlayStation Plus memberships for 50% off. So, 
Picked it up for 30 bucks. Got that. Grab Fall Guys. The way I saw it was, even though I missed it on Fall Guys when it came out like mid last year for free or December or whatever it was, uh, and it is a $20 game, so we did pay the 20 bucks. Normally, I would have paid 60 for PlayStation Plus anyway, so it was like, well, you know, at the end of the day, it's a wash. How did you right? not pick up Fall Guys? You didn't have PS Plus then? Uh uh-uh. uh. No. Oh. Yeah, it was really weird. Uh, dude, I go like several months at a time about it because most of what I play doesn't require PlayStation Plus. So there's no point in me having it half the time. And the free games that have been coming out are not exactly like the best games. Yeah. I did get whatever game was on PlayStation Plus for the month of February because uh, I was able to pick it up at the end. And we'll see what comes out this month. Uh, I want to say, oh, was it Control? Yeah, it was Control. I yeah, picked up Control's Control. dope. Yeah. yeah, so I picked up Control at the PlayStation Plus uh, game in a month. Uh, Fall Guys is definitely interesting. Uh, I had wanted to play it for some time. Uh, for those of you that do not know what Fall Guys is, it's basically kind of like a mini game set up in a sense where you have like 60 other players and you're all trying to achieve a certain goal, whether that goal is stay on the spinning tube or something in the middle of the sky and have fruit flying at you and trying to survive against other players or you're racing to a finish line via a bunch of different uh, mechanical parts moving around, like spikes and uh, pendulums and all this other crazy stuff that's knocking you into uh, essentially a goo or jello type stuff at the bottom. Uh, and that's really what you're doing. You're just trying to go against these 60 players in, in somewhat of a battle royale uh, setting of just trying to, well, to it, move forward, essentially, and yeah. outlast everybody. It's like, what's that game <clears throat> show where they have, like, the people trying to jump across the water? and this Yeah, and stuff? Super Ninja, something, I don't remember. No, it's not Ninja Warrior. It's, I know what you're talking about. It's the old, they would dub it over with, like, really bad yeah. English dubs. Yeah. yeah, I remember these. It used to be on, like, MTV or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's similar to that in a sense, except everybody's going at once to try and get to that angle. So it took us about really a week. We started getting used to it and kind of getting the idea of the puzzles. And um, for a while there, there's like five rounds, right? So you progress through, and on the fifth round, it's pretty much last man standing type of deal. And yeah, so we, for the first like several days of the week, we would only get to like the third round, and we just like could not get past it. It was like the curse of the third round. Yesterday, I got to the fifth round multiple times. Uh, for the first time, which was pretty nice, and finished, like, second place in several of them. So we're getting pretty close to to actually outlasting folks and and kind of moving forward into these rounds and potentially winning, uh, which is pretty cool. So the game itself, it's not bad. Uh, it's definitely addicting. Uh, after a while, you just kind of get there and you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I, I lost in that thing. Like, let me go to the next one. Let me play the next game. And it, it's pretty interesting. Uh, the other thing I've been playing, of course, is Apex Legends. So I... Finally hit level 100. Finally. So I got that nice little gold tag that has 100 on it. Uh, and I have a consistent group now uh, that I play with. So uh, I've so got jealous. a... What? Level 100? Or a consistent group? Just being able to play Apex. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, I play for a few hours at night. But I've got uh, this one person out in, like, South Carolina. Whenever she hops on, I'll... You know, if I'm, if I'm available or she's available, like, we'll, we'll party together. And then they have a friend... Uh, out in like California uh, that hops on as well so it's usually a few hours just kind of teaming up and it's fun just you know getting back and like playing with the same people consistently and just kind of getting that that repertoire in place like they're both like level 500 so I was joking with them the other night I'm like I'm shocked that y'all like have me join your group and and play consistently if you guys are like you're actually not bad you know for uh Somebody that's only been for a playing. scrub. Well, somebody that's been playing for several months, they're like, you're actually not bad at all. Like, we played with some higher level people that are just not that good. So I'm pretty stoked that there's that consistency now that I can hop on and if that group is on, I can play with the same people, get in that mindset of like, all right, like we know how we function as a team. We're kind of getting that point. We've only it's done good it four to have or five that times. kind of familiarity and strategy. Yeah, and we've only played together like four or five times. Uh like Nights, at least. And uh, it's fun. It, it's nice to have that familiarity, like you're saying. So, uh, other than that, we've got some cool articles this week. Uh, we've got the new Nintendo Switch rumor. Again, another Nintendo Switch rumor. Uh, we had the Pokemon Direct, as you had mentioned, uh, that we'll be talking about. And, of course, uh, E3 being canceled for a digital-only event. Uh, also, 
You can go ahead and listen to our prior episodes from weeks past on your favorite podcast applications. Months past. Months years past. past. Yeah, well, two years, yeah. I think two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Overcast, CastBox, everywhere you can find a podcast, we're on there. Leave a five-star review. And, uh, of course, find us on social media. Leave those comments on there via at the Game Deflators on Facebook and Instagram and at Twitter. Just don't leave any comments telling me about how Final Fantasy VII Remake is actually going to be on PS Plus because I looked it up. At Game Deflators on Twitter. Tell Ryan that. Okay. Trivia. Trivia, trivia. Give it to me, John. I, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, okay. Where is the best place to encounter wild Pokemon? Tall grass. That is correct. Let's move to the next question. (laughs) What can you do to make Pikachu really, really happy in Pokemon Red, Pokemon Blue, and Pokemon Yellow? Um, Pokemon. That's not... No, (laughs) no. What can you do to make Pikachu really, really happy in those games? I don't know. uh, Give him a rare candy. No. Use him to win in battle. That makes him happy? Apparently it does. Pikachu is bloodthirsty. Hmm. Seriously, that's what... Well, you could talk to your Pikachu in yellow. You can. And actually, it has on here, because it's multi, it says feed it, talk to it, use it to win in battle, give it it a toy. So, uh, yeah, bop it. Twist it. it. Twist it. Twist his tail. (laughs) Pika! (laughs) I know, man, they should have made like a Pikachu-themed bop it back in the 90s. That'd actually be pretty (laughs) badass. All right, so our... Pika! (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Chew. no don't do it no nintendo's gonna create it now and then they'll say that they're gonna send you a cease and desist it's coming right hey, now hey they owe me i invented the wii u years before it came out yeah don't worry they gave ryan a cease and desist you know years before it came out and then they're like hey look we're gonna go ahead and make this now uh all right so uh, new nintendo switch rumor sheds light on well it's new nintendo rumor sheds light on super nintendo switch is the title of the article and it's by tyler fisher at comicbook.com so, Ryan, we have seen so many damn Nintendo Switch Pro, Super Nintendo Switch, Nintendo NXT, Nintendo everything I can think of Switch it's like, rumors for the last year. It, people just, like, they're thinking if they keep bringing it up, they will will it to happen. And, like, at this point, it's everybody just kind of saying, we're a leaker, and we've got this rumor, and it's going to come out in this year, just hoping that it, it finally comes out. It's just, like, before PS5 and Xbox, like, just... We're back in that cycle of, I guess we're talking about, you know, people's imaginations again this week. But I do think that if if and when, I like Super Nintendo Switch. I think that that is way better of a naming convention than, like, the Wii U. Like, I think it will be marketable in a way that stands out. And I think that I just don't know how to kind of feel because, like, they've done so many numbers with the Switch and they have such a big install. And it seems like now is not really the time to start walking away from that audience. But it's going to be, like, five years. And, I mean, that's a pretty decent Nintendo time span, five years. You know, like, maybe six or seven. But the um, the rumor in the article of, like, okay, this is going to come out in 2022, and Breath of the Wild 2 is going to come out alongside of it. As soon as I heard that, it made me think about, well, GameCube wasn't doing so hot. You know, they made the Wii, and that blew up, but, like, they did a simultaneous Twilight Princess with launch of the Wii and then also coming out for the current gen. So they could totally do that with like a new, you know, Super Nintendo Switch version and a standard Switch version because I just, I already have anxiety about trying to get a hold of one of these things because like if it's been so hard to get a regular Switch four years after it came out, and it's been absolutely impossible to get a PS5 or an Xbox. Like, there's no way you're ever going to be able to buy one of these. Like, these things will be the rarest video game console ever made. Like, you might as you have an easier time going out and finding a Vectrix. 
Well, yeah, and that's actually pretty damn hard. Uh, I am still shocked that I picked that thing up complete in box and working a while back. Uh, several years ago, actually. It'll be easier than finding a Super Nintendo Switch. So, here's the thing. I think a lot of it right now is supply chain issues. Of course, you have problems with GPUs in the market not you know, hitting store shelves from both AMD and uh, NVIDIA. Of course, the GPUs that are tied to uh, the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X are both tied to AMD, so you've got that whole issue, or, or CPUs as well, I think. So, you've got all those problems occurring right now. Uh, I think that with a release of 2022, you're likely going to see the pandemic subside, if not, I wouldn't say gone, but, you know, subside to a significant amount that things are opening up and you have those items in store shelves. And, uh, I think you'll, I think you'll have an easier time in 2022 finding a switch than you would something like a PS5 or Series X in today's day, uh, or today's era, I guess you could say. And I also, feel like I got my original switch like four months yeah. After launch? I, I did too. I like, picked it up not too long after Mario Odyssey was out, and I, I walked in, there was like a pile of them. I grabbed the one I wanted, the the blue and, or the, what color controller? It's like red and blue or something? I don't remember. I got the gray. Yeah, I got the, the colorful one, the multicolor one. The neon. Yeah. Neon blue and pink or neon yeah. red or something. Neon red and blue. So I picked up that, and uh, I got my Mario Odyssey. They even gave me a coin, because the coins were still in stock uh, for the Mario Odyssey game, and boop, that was it. Like, it was uh, pretty straightforward. They had it in stock piles of It them was and... going to the store to buy something. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, I did read an article recently that we're not going to talk about today, but uh, there's something that came out that AMD and NVIDIA were stating that uh, GPU constraints and trying to find one could extend into 2022 uh, with the issues that they're having just via those supplies. So, I mean, it makes sense. If Nintendo releases in 2022 and even companies like NVIDIA and AMD are saying, we're going to have our product widely available 2022. You're not going to have any supply chain issues here. I imagine the PlayStation 5 and Series X will start seeing those kind of build up here in 2021 and then, of course, be widely available in 2022. And the Switch launching in that time frame, I mean, dude, they're going to be flooding the market with those in that time frame. So it makes sense. And from a timing standpoint, like, the Switch is doing well right now. There's no need to release a Nintendo Switch Pro at this point in time, given its growth and demand right now. There's really no point. So I could see Nintendo kind of holding off on this until they start seeing figures and saying, oh, well, you know what? We've dropped several, whatever percentage points in our sales of the Switch in the last few months. Let's go ahead and get that Switch, you know, that Super Nintendo Switch ready for release and make that announcement. So I could see something like that occurring. And 2022 sounds about right. Like yeah. spring of 2022. I also like the, uh, you know, they they say in the article, Switch the new Nintendo Switch is basically a PS4 with DLSS and a better CPU, so yeah. it's not going to be current gen. But Nintendo is never current gen; they're always kind of half a gen behind. But like the power that they will have with that. And maintaining, you know, now that they've, I think, committing to this idea of the Switch and not having to have this, like, you know, dual Nintendo company, like, trying to do, like, a half-hearted, you know, low-power home console, but absolutely wiping the floor in the portable market, combining those two things, but really being able to put, like, the power that you've never seen in that form factor, like that's going to be the thing that's going to be the most impressive is to see, like even if it doesn't have like a 4K display unless it's in docked mode, like I don't necessarily, that's not a, a make or break, but like to have like a nice crisp, you know, 1080p, good LCD screen that's, like, more akin to something you'd see on, like, a, a large smartphone or a small tablet, like, with really good resolution and, you know, just much stronger power behind it. I think that we could really see, like, a whole new leap of Nintendo that we really kind of have gotten kind of dripped to, you know, like... The Wii was a huge jump over the GameCube, but the Wii U didn't really feel that much better. Like, the Switch looks amazing. Like, all the games on the Switch look really good, but it's like 
sometimes it's hard to tell with how stylized and how, you know, Nintendo everything looks. Like, yeah, it's a really great looking Mario game, but what what would happen if you could do that with, like, the ultimate power? Give the ultimate power to Nintendo and let them, like, really go buck wild. And I think that we'll see some awesome stuff that you could take anywhere. Well, I think part of the reason that they don't go full out is and they're like that half a gem behind in a sense is that from a consumer friendly standpoint they're able to release a console at probably a lower half cost. the price yeah it's not half the price but like almost you know the, compared to like a uh the ps uh three yeah i mean was like 600 bucks at launch yeah and they released the switch was well like 250 or 300 i think somewhere around those lines probably i think it was like 250 uh god that was a long time ago but like the Switch too. I mean, the Switch is three hundred bucks, and you're looking at PS4 Pros and Series Xs and all these other things that are in the market at like four or five hundred dollars, whatever you're looking at. And at the end of the day, Nintendo's coming in with like this budget console that, you know, from an aspect like Fortnite, for example. Like if you can play Fortnite on the Switch and kids are going to play Fortnite, well, as a parent, are you going to buy a PlayStation? Are you going to buy an Xbox? Or are you going to buy a Nintendo Switch because it's you know a few hundred bucks cheaper and they just want to play Fortnite? Yeah, like, it, it makes sense that Nintendo is that, like, step behind, because they probably have greater profit margins anyways by offering up a console that doesn't have top premium... Well, they don't sell know. at a deficit. Yeah, so, like... They're I, not losing 50 bucks on every sale. Yeah, and they're never dropping their game prices, so half the time, like, a game that was 60 bucks five years ago is still $60 today. Well, yeah, and, like, how everything's getting ported to the Switch... You yeah. know, like, Fortnite's on there, and Fortnite looks great, but I was not really impressed with the trailer for Apex on Switch. No. I wouldn't play Apex on Switch. I wouldn't either, especially but the drift issues. I would probably play Apex on Super Nintendo Switch, because it would probably look and run a lot better, and it would be more equivalent to the other environments that I want to play that type of game in. Well, and your point, too, on, you know, games being ported over, it's not like they're doing a lot of heavy dev work. I'm sure there's some dev work that needs to go into it with porting a game over from, like, the Wii U over to uh, the Switch, but a lot of that work is done. So for them, they're even saving cost on those those things as well to bring those games over. So, like, Mario Kart 8, I would say, launched almost simultaneously with uh, the Wii U, in a sense. Not directly, you know, like, within a year or two, whatever it may be, but it... To me, it just felt like not as many people bought the Wii U, and then a ton of people bought Mario Kart 8 on the Switch. Like, when I first saw them, I'm like, what the hell? Like, I just bought on the Wii U not too long ago, and now I'm seeing it on the Switch. Like, what BS is that? So, like, that was just the first of many re-releases, in a sense, on the console. So, yeah, I think they're making hand over fist money, and there's no reason for them to, you know, worry about having the most up-to-date hardware and software. Yeah. So, I mean... It, it is what it is, but Nintendo, I mean, they've been around for years, they've been doing things right, they've got a model in place that has worked for them, and they're sticking to it, and, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, we'll have plenty of time to talk about this until it comes out, and I'm sure that we will again and again, and I'm sure that we've probably already had the same conversation basically three or four times already anyways. Yeah, it's always fun. But this next one, oh, John... Oh, John, are you ready for us to get attacked? Because I've got unpopular opinions. I am. I am uh, full of unpopular opinions. 2021 Pokemon Direct announces remakes and an open world game. This is by Max O'Keefe at Comics Beat. And I think we've... Or Matt O'Keefe. I think we've had an article by him in the past. And Okay, so people get ready to attack Ryan. Don't worry. I'm on your side here. My whatever, side? Whatever Ryan's side is, I'm probably going to be against it. But go on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. So first off... I think my favorite part about any direct now is the intro. Dude, that was a badass intro. It, it was, was so nostalgic and great. I loved every minute of it. Um, so if you didn't watch it, they pretty much, because it's, what, 25th anniversary, right? Yeah. So they went through and went from, like, the start to current for Pokemon and went through. I didn't realize Pokemon had that much crap, dude. Like... It was just like it's a 1995, or no, yeah, 1996, I guess, right? Um, it showed Pokemon Red, and it's like anime. And then it shows like the different dates, like trading card game. And then it goes to like the next big step. And they leap. showed like the evolution of all the products throughout the whole life. Like they showed like every gen of the anime, every gen of the game, the every e gen of the cards, every gen of like, you know, like the creation of Pokemon Go, the different movies that came out, like... 
there's been so much and it's been such a part of childhood and I love Pokemon. Like, I know that I've had controversial stuff about Pokemon before, but like, man, the intro was the only part of this direct that I cared about at all. Um, it was cool. I really liked it. Diamond and Pearl, not my favorite gen. That was really where they lost me. Like, Ruby and Sapphire, that was like my jam. That was like my last big one. I played some uh, Diamond. And there was a lot of stuff in Diamond that I thought was cool. The weather effects were cool. The story was, like, it, when it started to get, like, more deep, like, adding more stuff, more characters. There's good stuff about Diamond, but I don't really like the graphics adaptation that they did. It reminds me of, like, something that, like, like a mobile game. And I just... I'm not going to pick this one up. I'm not going to play this one. If I want, I could go back and play my Diamond if I ever feel like it. But I'm totally skipping this remake. Well, so here's uh, something we had discussed a while back. You and I had an episode. I think it was Pokemon is Dead or Pokemon is Dying. Something along those lines that we did probably a year ago. uh, Where we discussed really exactly this. That they release these remakes. And it's just it's the same model that's thrown over and over and over and over again. And for me, I haven't played a game since silver and gold because why it was literally it's just we're gonna slap in some new pokemon we're gonna throw it into this game we might make a few tweaks like oh instead of team rocket it's team magma and team you know whatever the hell you want to call it and that's it it's the same old model um it, it'd be kind of like the tv show like has a tv show truly adapted has from, ash ever had a birthday right like ash is he's changed his voice so i mean i don't know what's going on there but you know at the end of the day it's like been the same model and somebody will prove me wrong here and say oh well this happened and this happened this happened but no like at the end of the day that's the base model for pokemon it's been consistent you got your three starters you open up with it you go from your town you explore the world you go into tall grass you always learn hey this is like the tutorial component like how many times do i need to start a pokemon game and have the tutorial how many rivals do i have to have with just a different world it's like it's kind of like looking at fallout but turning it into pokemon like fallout's been the same consistent model for years with just expanded worlds and expanded, uh, you know, experiences, but it's been the same model. Different stuff, yeah. same base. And so we had actually brought up, like, we would love to see an open world style Pokemon game where you could actually explore the world as is. And like, finally, I feel that we finally have that. You know, we we'll see. But like an action RPG, like what it truly should have been. Experiencing That's not an action RPG. Though. No, what they have. <laughs> well, no, what they've brought up and what is it, Arceus? is an action RPG. I mean, you're running around, you're going through likely different missions that you have to accomplish, sneaking through grass to catch Pokemon in a manner that is not, I have to run around, have a random encounter, and by luck, happen to find the Pokemon I want, weaken it down, and then catch it. This seems like the type of Pokemon game that we've, I would say, I've been clamoring for for a long time. Something that's fresh and is going to allow me to actually get into it. See, this is my this is my big take. I think that it's not going to be good unless... I mean, it's still very early to say this, but they're going to have to show me a lot of other systems to make this interesting and compelling because my takeaway from what I've seen is basically it's in a region that already exists. I mean, obviously this is in the past, so it's going to be slightly different, but they're working with like the same area so it has to be true to form and it's going to be a large map it's going to have like one town and you're going to be going out and like you said doing missions catching pokemon that stuff's all normal but the thing with like big open world map stuff like it feels really soulless and uninteresting if you don't have stuff to do so like going out and fighting pokemon and training pokemon when you can like you know, see them on the map. That's a cool next stage for Pokemon, but you got to be able, there's got to be other stuff to do besides just throwing Pokeballs. And it looks like it's still the same combat, but just a different flow and just in the world. Like it's still just choosing moves and watching your Pokemon do those moves. So like you're going to just run across a big open map. There's not going to be like in fallout how, or in, Skyrim or uh, Breath of the Wild or stuff where there's like, oh, look, there's like 
random caves everywhere and stuff. And I can just dip into all these places because if they're working with the established map already, they're already going to have all those locations mapped out and it's going to have to stay true to that. And like, well, to an extent, what so... are you doing in the world besides just the Pokemon stuff? Like in every open world game, that's good. There's so many more systems. There's like foraging and crafting and doing all this stuff. So I got to see what else is going to be in this game. Cause from what I saw in the trailer, it just looks like, Oh, I'm going to run over here. There's a Pokemon. I guess that's that. And it's not really ever going to be anything different than that same thing, just with a different background behind it. And that's not any more compelling for me than what Pokemon already is now. So I would disagree on it in that, of course, it is too early. If this turns into, say, a Breath of the Wild type of Pokemon game where you can run around and explore every single component you're going to have elements in this game. They will have to create elements that make it different. Like, yes, you do have that world that already exists, and you've got your caves and other things, but that's only a fragment of probably what exists in that world because you just know, okay, town to town, I go to this area, and that's kind of it, right? I mean, we're looking at uh, an aspect of, yeah, you saw that cave entrance, right? But what about above the cave entrance? What about the mountains that surround it? If you're going into the forest, well, now I can go through every component of the forest. Maybe there was a cave somewhere in the forest I never knew about. I think there's elements that you'll be able to build and create upon within the actual world that's already established. I think there's a lot more that can be developed in there. It's kind of like when you look at uh, Fall, like Fallout 3, for example. You know, you go to the capital and there's it's pretty straightforward what's in the capital and whatnot but there's caves that are created like underneath and there's a whole other world that you can explore there and i could potentially see that happen um the islands that may surround the the region right any sort of like ocean in that surrounding area they can build upon that you don't have to have like okay well there was this four i these four islands that you could explore in that world well no you can expand on that you can bridge it into have smaller islands caves that are within the ocean like all these crazy things that can occur and i think we'll see that developed as time goes on i don't think you can escape from the combat based system the main reason being is within pokemon itself like the anime and all of that it is turn-based so yeah, i mean yeah like i'm Pikachu, okay with the you know. the the battle style being there but like it there's got to be more to the game than just that one and I think that'll system happen. for engaging with the world. And I think that what it's going to come down to is they're going to have to like if you're going to make a like an open world like this is a world and Pokemon are in this world, you're going to have to have like more stuff like like a Breath of the Wild. You do you you climb, you glide, you hop on your shield and surf around. Like there's so many like different systems even for just movement and i think that you need to take pokemon and make them more real in the world like instead of having fly be just a teleport mechanic to get you to whatever town like you'll likely be flying get on the pokemon and fly around like i want to see these pokemon and use these pokemon in ways that like are like the tv show in a sense the, thing, well, the crazy things that happen in the show. Well, that are just using systems that, like, open world games use that, like, make sense, that make the world feel, like, whole and, you know, consistent. And just having Pokemon standing around, wandering around, waiting for you to fight or capture them and doing nothing else in the game except for, like, cutting a tree down here, like... That's all fine for that interface, but, like, if you're going to be in this believable world, like, there's got to be way more interaction and engagement. Or, like, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, and they were like, well, what if there was a system where, like, if you were in a fight, like, other Pokemon nearby might hear it and rush in to help or attack or, you know, whatever. Like, some things like that. I think we'll have that. I mean, I it's so early. We're looking at 2022. We're only in the beginning of 2021. They got a full year to work on this and get updates out to us. I think we'll see that. I really do think that we're going to see that open world concept that we've wanted, that interaction that you're talking about. I think a lot of the crazy things that happen in the show that we don't get to experience on a game level, we'll likely see some of that bleed through. I mean, come on, like surfing Pikachu and like all these other crazy things that happen. In the world, I can see that happening in this type of game. Like, really kind of expanding on the things that they've always wanted to do, but probably couldn't because they were constrained to a handheld console. And then, even though they had on the Switch, they kind of constrained themselves by releasing a very similar concept type game. I think this is the 
the game changer for them. This is definitely going to move them forward. And this is what I'm looking forward to. So the more information I see in the coming year is likely going to compel me to purchase this game like day one. And I will play this game so long as it does meet that like you know, that criteria that we're talking about, like really kind of expanding on it and deviating away from like what we've known for 25 years. They've been Pokemon. in that comfort bubble long enough. Yeah. It's time for Game Freak to, yeah, to move and it I up. I will fully support that and purchase this game day one so long as that's what we're looking at. All also, right. oh. uh, one last thing. Pokemon Snap looks really good. Yeah, it actually, it looked pretty good, actually. It um, looks like something, though, that I would definitely like, want to rent yeah or borrow or buy used later mm -hmm. i don't think it's something that i would keep and enjoy and use enough to be like yeah they're 60 dollars. <laughs> yeah unless there's some sort of special edition that's not a day one purchase for me it's more of a sit back and relax and play a type of thing every now and then it just doesn't it doesn't appeal to me as a day one type of buy versus arceus does um i think that'll be a, a good game so long as you know like i said hits those criteria all right, next article we have here, E3 2021 as a live event is canceled going forward as digital, working on broadcast options at LA Live and LACC. So I guess that's the LA Convention Center. Uh, and what's funny is that, um, you know, when I was in San Diego, uh, or no, it's always been LA, hasn't it? E3? Yeah. yeah, I was thinking Comic-Con. Comic-Con is actually supposed to go to LA as well at some point, mm. uh, from what I had heard. That was from people in San Diego last time I was there. But this is by... Uh, uh, Rosti, it looks like, at Reset Era. So uh, this is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we kind of figured this would likely be happening with a lot of these big conferences. Uh, so, you know, because of the pandemic and such, you're not going to look at getting 30, 50, 60,000 people together for a giant, you know, multi-day event around video games. And it's just not going to happen. Not right now. But it does make me kind of wonder if they are able to put this off successfully and do virtual meetings between different executives and uh, really showcase those games and, you know, maybe do 24-hour, uh, 48-hour demos for consumers where it's just released out on, like, your standard consoles and you can play those for a couple hours or just, you know, even like Final Fantasy VII, like, after their presentation, you could download the demo and that's what you're playing, get you excited. Are we entering an era now where E3 is just never going to be in person again? Because if this is successful... And you're able to really just drive that home to all the consumers that couldn't, couldn't attend. Why would you do a physical event at that point? Like, video games are moving into more of a digital era anyways. So why would you need to have a physical conference to show digital-based material? Well, I mean, they do have here... Um, it says that they're working on licensing for 2022 and 2023. So there's not, you know... There's not no chance of it ever coming back to a physical, but really what you lose out on in not having these physical conventions is you're not ever going to realize the game that didn't come out three years from now because two people didn't meet in a back room with some young indie dev and gave him, you know, his big start and he went on to do great things like those are the things that really get lost. Like, as far as us, the consumers, what we get out of the conferences, they could do just fine without having any physical thing at all. It's just, it's good for the industry to have face-to-face, -face, especially this industry, because, like, there's so much more collaboration and and s inspiration and stuff, like, that happens at these events that's so inspiring. Like, it's cool to go and see people do crazy cosplay. It's awesome to see, you know, a line of people three hours long because they're dying to just, you know, they gotta play this new thing and it's like the most hype thing that they're gonna do all summer. You know, there's, there is a lot of cool stuff, but I think that we'll get by another year and things will be okay and i think that you know even if um even if all of the companies just want to start doing direct style stuff you know like uh there was just a digital state of play last week not really anything super compelling there i watched a couple of the blizzcon digital event things i mean those things looked okay you know 
not really talking about that specifically, but like the ability to do it totally independently is one thing. I just don't understand how this really works for like E3 itself as an organization because Sony, Microsoft, Ubisoft, Nintendo, they're all fine. They'll all do their thing. They'll all make their own marketing and stuff. But what happens to E3, the organization, when it can't when it can't do this anymore? What happens yeah. to it? I mean, who knows? I mean, we'll have to see how this goes off and then Do you know, they maintain the- being a thing if there is no real expo? Like if they're not really doing the thing that they're kind of there to do? Do they exist online as a, as just a naming convention to link all these things together once a year? That seems kind of arbitrary and unnecessary. Well, being in, in this kind of side of business and, you know, for my personal living, I mean, what a lot of companies like this are doing that handle these types of expositions, I mean, they're still doing well. They're still getting sponsors. They're still getting, attendees like i'm looking at an event uh, right now that i'm planning for my company that it's nine thousand people have registered for an event that typically has three thousand people so i think that you're going to be hitting a wider audience you're still going to have registrations people are still going to have to pay for this type of stuff for something like e3 but do They're, people need to do that when they can just watch well, the you, release on youtube well, they can just the watch the sony conference that's the thing is and it, not even need the e3 part of it but is it going to be released on youtube some of those components are there going to be special codes that you get as being a registrant where you can download a specific demo through sony like hey when you go ahead and register for our event you have download codes to be able to play however amount of demos mm. uh, that come out or uh, if you want to see a specific presentation from an indie developer that may not be released to the public you know where are you going to go for that so like i think that there is a place to make this you know a digital only type of event and that could potentially happen just based on where the market is going uh but it would be nice to have and i i get it dude like i totally agree that in-person feeling those cosplay uh those cosplays that occur um and being able to see the different vendors and like handle the products and the electronics that are coming there and like really take a good look at it and talk with those developers in person. Like, I think you do need that. But at the same time, I do think something like this could flourish on a digital scale and it wouldn't necessarily impact the overall, like, event, I guess you could say. Like, it's not going to impact the industry as hard as you would think it would uh, from having it in-person versus virtual. But at the end of the day, we're not sure how this is going to pan out. I mean, we could still in 2022 still have issues with getting together in person. Like, we don't know. 2021 for sure. It's definitely going virtual. 2022, we'll have to see what happens. But I don't think this is a deal breaker for it moving forward. It's so weird. This is very, like, thinking about this while we're talking about it, my brain's running. And it kind of reminds me of, like, the whole GameStop thing. Where it's, like, us as, like, a you know, gamers, you know, our community and stuff. We kind of have this, like nostalgia for these you know physical icons that bring gaming to us in these certain ways and you know nobody has like too much love for game stuff but like it would suck to not have that at all nobody has too much love for e3 but it would really suck to not have that at all but arguably the industry doesn't really need either of them because digital release for everything is kind of just the future of this, you know, whole thing that we do. So it's yeah. it's kind of bizarre how they're similar and kind of like in the same kind of boat for kind of similar reasons. But you never would really think of like the place where you buy games and the place where you learn about brand new games and deals are made and you get demos and releases and stuff like they're not the same, but. They're close. Yeah. Well, uh, the next thing we have coming up here is our inflation deflation of the week. So this week we were playing Splatoon, developed by Nintendo EAD, uh, published by Nintendo, and created by is that Hisashi, Hisashi Nogami. Nogami. Okay, cool. I actually got that. Uh, and it was released May of 2015. It is a third-person shooter, and the reception on this game initially was an 8. This was released on the Wii U. Uh, my initial thoughts on this game, having come into it extremely fresh, only kind of see any outside looking in on this, I understood the general concept. 
squid people shooting ink guns at each other and multiplayer. I did not realize that there was a huge story component that's tied to it. And, you know, really that, that level sense, like World 2, World 3 type of setting that comes with it, and really the mechanics of it. I had a lot of fun, dude, playing this. Uh, I think the music was pretty good. It definitely had some great graphics going for it. The controls worked well. And as somebody that plays or has played third-person shooters for a number of years, uh, like, you know, mature rated games on that scale, uh, played first-person shooters, and just really has enjoyed shooters uh, in the past, I definitely liked this. It was pretty good. It all, like, worked together mechanically. It made sense. I think that with the Wii U, the motion component, like, using the gamepad was a little offsetting or off-putting, uh, primarily because it's just difficult to kind of get used to that, and I just can't imagine doing that in a multiplayer setting online, uh, you know, when the Wii U had its multiplayer uh, gaming. But, yeah, I mean, overall, I really did like it, and I think it definitely is deserving of an 8. And as long as that story is fairly long, uh, you know, I... I should go back into it and check it out. I think the, yeah, I think that the first game story is like pretty like level based and in interesting. But I think the second one I heard has like a, a pretty interesting story. That's like a little more compelling. Um, I never really played either of the Splatoons. Uh, I didn't have a Wii U. So, and I wasn't really looking forward to Splatoon 2 because I never played Splatoon 1, so I never picked that up on Switch. But, like, having kind of played with it, and, like, you know, John was saying from an outside observer looking in, like, I get it now. Like, we didn't spend a whole lot of time with the game, but I totally get it. I get why Splatoon 3 is coming out now. Uh, you know, I I feel a lot more for that trailer, having spent a little bit of time with Splatoon one now and i think that yeah it's a it's a cool franchise and nintendo's you know i mean nintendo always makes great stuff feels great it's got all that charm it's got a lot of uh it's got a lot of different energy to it that you know i think really stands out and makes it appealing cuz it's got that whole kind of street kind of wear and graffiti and kind of aspect to it and a lot of that stuff that i've seen in games and stuff like from the 90s you know early 2000s don't really see as much of that kind of genre kind of spin on stuff and i think it really works for it and i don't know it's a good game would would you think we were going to say there was a bad game it's a good game I mean, like, initially, uh, my thought was, we're going to play this, and we're going to be like, all right, yeah, it's a first-person shooter, or a third-person shooter, whatever, like, that's it. You know, like, it, it's okay. But I haven't played it. I mean, it it really did And there's so much good. more to it that we don't even know. Like, there's so many different guns, and obviously, like, the multiplayer is where it's at. Yeah, and of course, we're not going to get that with, with this specific game, which is why... You know, I would say if you're looking to buy this one, buy it cheap primarily because you're not getting that multiplayer experience. You're just getting the storyline experience. And it really depends on how much you want to look into it. So if you're a story driven individual and you want, and I don't know if there's any tie in with number two and probably number not. three, probably not. But, you know, if you want to get that concept of that world and really understanding it, I think this is a great buy. And I mean, okay, so we'll get into brass tacks really quick. So you got complete in boxes sitting at 1175 right now. Uh, that peaked at fifty one ninety nine in July of twenty fifteen. Of course, that is trending down. Uh, and then the loose, you can find this at eight sixty four. Peaked at fifty one in June of twenty fifteen, and uh, you're looking at that trending down as well. So, you know, obviously it's it's on the Wii U. It's not on the Switch. So there's no remake or anything that's happened with that. Uh, I think at eleven seventy five. You can definitely find this for ten bucks, but I think at eleven seventy five, like that's just right. Like that's the right price for a game like this, and I think you're you're gonna end up getting it cheaper most likely. But if you found it like twelve bucks, it's it's two dollars difference. It's not make or break on that. I think it's still a really good game for that price point. Yeah, yeah. This is this is totally at a just right. Uh, I will say though, I would not buy this. I would spend the extra 20 bucks and get a copy of Splatoon 2 because you can actually play it online. It has, you know, a, an existing player base and live servers. And, you know, it's probably the same game, but just more. And I don't think that this is necessary to go into the next one because I've never met a shooter that was like that. 
except for maybe Mass Effect, I guess. Red Faction? There could be one kill zone, I guess. I don't know. There's a variety of them out there, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is. I think you know. Buy the said, second one. Get this one if you're a collector. Yeah, if you're a collector, buy this one. If you think that you just want to, like I said, get into that story and kind of understand the Splatoon world from the very get-go from its creation, jump into this one. Check if it out. If you only have a Wii U for some reason yes. and don't have <laughs> this game, I guess get it. Yeah, so this one I actually picked up as part of a, a pretty big Wii U collection uh, that I picked up for... So, okay, so I remember exactly what it was. I picked up a Wii U and a ton of games, and I got this one, Pokemon Tournament, and... Oh, that's what we should play next. We should play the Pokemon Tournament game. The fighting game. The fighting game? game? Yeah, yeah, I've I'm never pretty, played I'm that I'm pretty either. sure I have... You can probably see it over there on the left if I have Pokemon Tournament. Or Pokemon, whatever it's called. It should be there. I know I picked up Splatoon... And several other games in that time frame. Uh, so, yeah, I picked up for like, it was like a hundred bucks, dude, to get the Wii U and a whole bunch of stuff. So, I, of course, like, got rid of the Wii U and kept a number of the games that I really wanted. Uh, but that said, so Just Right is going to be our rating on here. We'll be keeping an eye out on my shelf here to try and find the next game that we play. I don't I, see it. Uh, I'm pretty sure if I don't have it there, it's likely sitting in a bin. So, we'll find it. I want to play more of that NES remix sometime. Oh, man, dude. That, that was, was fun. so good. That was so good. So, yeah, well, I'll check to see if I got it. Uh, if not, I'll just go buy it. Uh, but if we don't play that... I'm we'll play eyeing, something else. I'm eyeing something right there on the uh, Genesis. Oh, yeah, the uh, OG Mutant League football. Yeah. That'd be fun. That might be fun, too. So we'll find something. But Mutant League football sounds like a good idea as well. All right. Well, uh, of course, as we said earlier, if you were listening to this episode, uh, check us out on your favorite podcast application or find another one. Uh, that's out there and give us a five-star review find us on social media leave those comments Uh, but this has been episode 121 of the game of podcast my name is john i'm ryan and thanks for listening